Good evening and welcome to Crime Watch. We're live for the next 60 minutes with crime investigations, news and appeals. A full reconstruction of the John Goldfinger Palmer case in just a moment. But first, a brief look at what else we have for you tonight. We have a fresh collection of wanted faces, one who many of you will recognise. Get dialing straight away if you know where any of them are. Plus, some truly shocking crimes caught on camera, including this horrendous attack on a woman in South London. Also tonight, the inside story of a dogged investigation into a fatal hit and run, which led detectives on the trail of a mysterious Russian millionaire. This is John Palmer, a notorious figure linked to a string of huge timeshare frauds. He was once described as Britain's richest criminal with a fortune of £300 million. No doubt he also had plenty of enemies, but what we need to know tonight is who would want to hire a professional hitman to kill him. It would be hard not to know who John Palmer was. The man known as Britain's richest prisoner has been ordered to hand over £35 million to help compensate the victims of his crime. John Palmer, who's also known as Goldfinger, is serving an eight-year sentence for one of the world's biggest timeshare swindles. Palmer was originally nicknamed Goldfinger after being acquitted of handling gold from the Brinksmat bullion raid in 1983. At one point, he even appeared next to the Queen on the Sunday Times Rich List with an estimated fortune of £300 million. Without doubt, he has made mistakes in his life. I believe he's paid for those mistakes. In 2009, after spending a number of years in and out of prison, John returned to his family in Essex. I was incredibly proud of the way that he'd readjusted to a very, very normal life. My dad was like my best friend and my dad, so it was always games, as you say, as large as, as, large as life. He's not this gangster that everyone would, would paint him to be in the press or the media. He spent all of his time with either my mum or, or myself or my sisters. You know, there was never a day that went past that I spent with him that he wasn't laughing or joking around. He was never serious about anything. Um, the time I did spend with him was, was quality time. On the 24th of June last year, John and his family were at their home in South Weald. I quite often work in the kitchen and I was trying to send some emails and, and be quite serious about things and he was just very, very playful. He pulled the hairband from my hair, just generally really, really infuriating. Unable to concentrate on her work, Christina went horse riding at around 2 p.m. What? It was just a bit of fun. I apologised to him because I'd been a little bit tough on him. I told him off for being so infuriating. I told him I loved him and he gave me a kiss and that was the last time I saw him alive. After Christina left, John spent the next few hours outside. Previously unreleased CCTV captures him as he walks around the garden. His son James and his girlfriend were in the house. I was studying in the kitchen because I had two financial regulatory exams that I was going to be sitting in about two months' time. My girlfriend was in the lounge. She wasn't at work that day, so she was just relaxing, watching TV. My dad was pottering around in the garden uh, with the dogs at the back of the garden. I mean, started a bonfire, which wasn't uncommon. At around five o'clock, James and his girlfriend decided to work out in the home gym. While they exercised, John continued to collect things in his buggy to burn on the fire. 
These are the last CCTV images of him. girlfriend went outside. She could see my dad lying there. James! I really didn't realise anything had happened. There was, there was no sound. I didn't hear any voices. I didn't actually hear my dogs bark. I heard no gunshots. Call someone, go! Dad, Dad. You know, it was just very, very quiet. Dad, Emergency, my dad's passed out. He's covered in blood. I, I don't know what's wrong with him. Mom, Dad. I'm strong there. You're doing everything that you can. Because I could still feel his heart beating. I, I thought there'd be a chance that I'd, we could keep him alive. I felt so hopeless because I had to watch him die in front of me. Um... I can totally understand that the, there might be some people that don't have a tremendous amount of empathy towards our situation or, or the loss of John purely because of his reputation. But I think forgetting John Palmer, forget who this is about, what you've got to stop and think about or what we have to stop and think about is that there is someone out there who is prepared to do such a barbaric act, you know, just to, to assassinate someone. A cold-blooded and brutal murder. Well, DCI Stephen Jennings is the lead detective on the case. And are you sure this was a professional hit? Yes, we, um, we strongly believe this is very much a professional hit, therefore contract killing. Um, what our inquiries therefore had to do is not only identify and locate the gunman, but also try to identify and prosecute um, whoever's commissioned this crime. And why do you think he was killed? Um, our inquiries since um, June of last year has led us on to two very significant lines of inquiry. The first, that John was due to stand trial for real estate fraud in mainland Spain in April of this year. Uh, that coupled with some key crimes that were committed in the UK during 2015 and also some law enforcement intervention with organised crime and organised crime families. And those key crimes in the UK you're talking about, Hatton Garden, there are rumours that his death could have been linked to that? Yes, there's a lot of speculation around Hatton Gardens and it is something that we are considering along with other crimes that were committed during that time. So is that a strong line of inquiry for you? Yes, it's one of many, but um, yes, it's something we are looking at. Now, shots were not heard by his son, but what do you know about the gun that was used? OK, we think the gun is very similar to the one shown here. Um, it's a self-loading revolver, we believe sm uh, smooth bore and also .32 calibre rounds were used. And where he lived? is a very secluded area, but there were some people in the area that you would really like to talk to. Yes, his house surrounded by woodland in, in, in a country park. Um, this male shown here was seen uh, by members of the public at around the time that John was murdered, as described as five foot ten, white, wearing baggy clothing. And we can see a map as well of the area where he was killed, because there were also people the day before who were seen digging in the area. Yes, there are other witnesses that we are trying to trace, in particular two men that were seen around midday, um, 24 hours before, 
beforehand, the 23rd of June, and we would very much like to see and, and identify these two people. The house, the house is right in the middle here, really secluded, but there were two women who were caught on camera by somebody that day. Yes, a member of public um, has, has come forward and identified a photograph. These two women were seen in the background of the photograph, so we would like them to contact us or anyone that can identify them. And obviously there's no suggestion they're anything to do with the case. They just happened to be in the area at the time and you would like to talk to them. Yes, they could very much have key evidence. There is, as well, a substantial reward on offer. Yes, the, um, the family have independently offered £50,000 leading to the arrest and conviction of those or parties involved in this crime. OK, thank you. Well, as you've heard, John Palmer may have had his enemies, but no one deserves what happened to him. The gunman and those behind him need to be caught. If you can help in any way, please call now on our usual number, 0500 600 600. Detectives are standing by for your calls. A roundup of crime news now, and starting with the release of previously unseen CCTV of a shocking attack on a woman in South London. This footage shows the moment the woman was punched several times in the attack in Hanover Park in Lewisham on Friday, the 4th of December. She was left unconscious on the pavement as the attacker ran off. Now, detectives believe it's linked to two other violent attacks on lone women in the Lewisham area in December and January. In this CCTV, a woman is followed home at Creekside at around 5 a.m. on New Year's Day. Just out of sight of the camera, she's grabbed and punched unconscious. In the third attack on Friday, the 4th of December, another woman was grabbed and punched in the head several times in commercial way. Now, police would like to speak to this man in connection with their inquiries. If you can help, please, please, please do get in touch with us using the numbers on the screen. Police are offering a 20,000 pounds reward in connection with the case. Well, also in London, the Met Police want your help in tracking down a group responsible for a large-scale disturbance on the 31st of October last year. Police came under attack when they tried to break up an illegal Halloween rave on Lambeth High Street. 23 officers were injured, as was a police dog, as the disturbance spread over the surrounding streets, continuing into the early hours. Well, joining me now is Commander B.J. Harrington from the Met. Commander, a very good evening to you. These are pretty ugly scenes. I mean, this was some of the most serious public disorder we've seen in, in some years. Um, we've had officers attacked with bottles, bricks, paving slabs, even a petrol bomb, many of them hospitalised. And, of course, we had police dog Maverick that was kicked and beaten and sprayed with a noxious substance. And, of course, a South London community that has been terrorised throughout the night. I think it's really important to stress that the people who arrange these, these unlicensed music events are putting people's lives at risk. And as you see from the, from the video, uh, they're prepared to use a lot of violence when we try to stop them. So, Commander, a pretty big disturbance. What is the latest? You've made 73 arrests. No doubt you're looking to make more tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's four faces here of people we'd like to identify to arrest. Uh, and we want to be really clear. We'll be relentless in tracking these people down. And also the other 45 people uh, who are on our website who we want to identify. Uh, Commander, thank you very much indeed. If you recognise anyone in this footage then please call the numbers on the screen now check out this incredible CCTV of a bungling burglar who knocks himself out after falling through a garage roof in South Wales David Powers police are investigating the attempted burglary at Pante garage in Llethley happened around 12 30 and 1 a.m. last Thursday the man was attempted to break in he was unconscious for around five minutes before his accomplice climbed down to see if he was okay both then flee empty-handed poor lad if you know who these men are then do give us a call. And finally, we're well used to crimes being reenacted here on Crime Watch, but this very rare footage, uncovered and preserved by the British Film Institute, shows what's thought to be the world's first filmed crime reconstruction. In a forerunner to one of our How They Caught films, the clip recreates the moment the Liverpool fraudster Thomas Gowdy was arrested in 1901. Gowdy was working at a bank when he stole £170,000 to pay gambling debts. Even the crooks dressed well back in the day. Overall, gun crime has fallen significantly in recent years, but worryingly, the very latest figures show a spike in offences. Proportionally, Birmingham now has more gun violence than anywhere else in the UK. We asked Marcia Shakespeare, whose 17-year-old daughter, Letitia, was killed in a drive-by shooting in the city 
to investigate. 2003 Birmingham. The police in Birmingham had got used to gun crime, but nothing like this. In the early hours of this morning, they were called to a shooting outside a party at a hairdresser's salon. The whole area had been sprayed with gunfire. They found two teenage girls shot dead and two others wounded. My daughter, Letitia, was one of them. She was just 17 years old. I don't want another incident. It has got to stop now. If you do not come forward after this... Just watching that brings me back to the point of being in that room and thinking about what the hell's happening. Why am I actually saying these things? Now it's been 13 years and I'm back asking the question about guns on the streets of Birmingham. In the last decade, gun crime has fallen significantly in the UK. But worryingly, latest statistics now show a rise. Here in the West Midlands, there are proportionately more incidents than anywhere else in the country. Thank you. Kenny Bell is head of the forces CID. So what is the situation with gun crime now? So we've certainly seen in the summertime to autumn of last year a spike, specifically around the people who were using guns, but then discharging them as well, which is really concerning. In the six months to January this year, 47 gunshots have been recorded in the West Midlands, compared to 48 in the whole of 2014. And three people have been killed. Kenny is taking me to the scene of one of the recent shootings that happened in January. Just down here, um, Marcia, it was half four in the afternoon. A lad was on a bike, uh, got off his bike, took out the gun he had, fired it four times. Um, it was luck, not judgment, but we weren't dealing with four fatalities there. Wow. Um, ran back to his bike, kept his gun, and is away. So damaging because it seems like a nice, quiet residential area, and yet gun crimes taking place. And concerning for me is, is that was at half four in the afternoon in daylight. That person is still outstanding, and I've not recovered that gun yet. My investigators are out working relentlessly hard to identify it, and the community can absolutely help us. There's, there's some mother, some girlfriend, some father, some brother knows where that gun is and can help me to take that gun off the street. But why are guns being used more often? I'm meeting Daryl Laycott from Manchester. Gun crime has affected us both. He served 12 years in prison for firearms offences, but says he's turned his life around. Like me, he now works with young people, steering them away from a life of crime. It was widely known that I was pretty heavily involved in violence. So I was shot on three occasions within four years. I seen my mate get killed in front of me. I, I seen it all. Did you, at that point, decide to leave that life? No, if anything. That made me want to stay on the road more. I wanted revenge. OK. What caused someone to shoot you? Um, just retaliation, really, tick for tat, from the very beginning. My daughter, when she was murdered, my response at that point was, I just want justice. And I didn't want justice in the sense to say, well, I'm going to go and retaliate. I'm going to go and think, well, someone's killed my child, so you know what, I'm going to go and kill somebody else's child. When I was on the streets, I wanted the justice of the streets. But, yeah, I would put my family through a load of stress, you know. A bullet went through the window of my mum's house and she was nearly it. That's through my selfish behaviour that people was coming to my house. 
I've lost over 30 friends and family. It's really hard, but I don't think it's as hard for me as it's you because you give birth to your daughter. Every parent wants for them kids to live, outlive them. The desire to avenge and the tit for tat that Daryl talks about is something I know only too well. My daughter and her friends were caught between two warring gangs. Since her death, police have developed more tools to help them tackle gun crime, including the National Ballistics Intelligence Service based here in Birmingham. Most of the shooting incidents that we see are actually uh, urban street gangs um, or organised crime groups. Experts here are using cutting-edge forensic technology to gather crucial evidence from the scene of a crime. They are able to identify the type of gun and the ammunition and whether they've been used by criminals before. We see a number of different types of firearms, but predominantly it is handguns. And the most recent trend we've observed is an increase in the use of antique handguns. The position at the moment within the UK is if you don't have a criminal record, anyone can buy a, an antique firearm. This is uh, a Saint-Étienne revolver, 11mm French Ordnance revolver, dates from 1873. Under UK legislation, this is regarded as an antique because the ammunition is, is obsolete. But this is the sort of weapon that we're seeing commonly used uh, in the West Midlands. The criminals make the ammunition to actually fit this weapon. With the work of Nabis, the picture of gun crime is clearer. But does a rise in shootings mean more guns on the streets? We're certainly seeing firearms that are used on the streets now that have never been seen before, and a lot of them are based on this antique firearm. We're seeing some guns that are being used more than once in a crime as well. I think what it shows, though, is that, that there are few firearms available, so people have to use these different methods to try and find guns. So what are the police doing to stop gun crime? In the unfortunate times when a, a shooting does occur, yeah. our investigations are relentless. Scenes of crime, witnesses, house to house, we're doing everything we can to identify and bring to justice those responsible. We're executing warrants, we're doing a firearms operation almost every day in 2016 so far. But we're not just going to arrest our way out of this. It's critical that we ensure that the generation of toddlers now, in 10 or 15 years' time, aren't that generation that are wanting to get involved in gangs, aren't wanting to commit crime or robberies and feel they need to use a gun to do that. Thankfully, the level of gun crime is significantly lower now than when my daughter was killed. And compared to other countries, shootings are relatively rare. But I know one is enough to cause a lifetime of a heartache. If you think you can help with the shooting in January featured in Marcia's report, full details are on the website. You can also find a special interview with the Chief Constable of West Midlands Police talking about why he wants more armed officers on the streets as well as his concerns over antique weapons laws. Right, still to come, the urgent hunt for this man wanted for raping a teenager at a nature reserve in broad daylight. It has made a huge impact on my life. I would feel so happy to know that he could never do anything like this to anyone again. But we've got wanted faces first, starting with James or Jamie Acord, who you might recognise as one of the original suspects in the Stephen Lawrence murder inquiry. The 39-year-old is wanted for questioning by detectives in connection with the supply of cannabis worth in excess of £4 million. Police say this photo gives a better idea of how he looks now. He's always denied involvement in the 1993 killing of Stephen Lawrence. A court has links to South East London, Kent and also to Spain. Next is Tarek Javed, although he's also known as Derek. He was on trial for multiple counts of sexually abusing a child under the age of 13, but didn't hang around to be found guilty and went on the run. 
He's 37 and originally from Pakistan, but has close links to Greater Manchester and London. He's a dangerous sex offender, and police say anyone found harbouring him will be prosecuted. Third is Daniel Dean Rutter, although he also calls himself Peter Arthur Plum. He escaped from prison last month, where he was serving a life sentence for wounding with intent. Rutter is 43 and has scars across his chest and right arm. He has connections across Surrey and also to Dover. Finally for now is this man who goes by the name Q Johnson, although you may know him as Ricky or Jamie Sampson. He's 21 and wanted for questioning by detectives after a man was stabbed in Reading, suffering a punctured lung. As well as Reading, Johnson has links to Bedford and the Wandsworth area of London. If you know where any of tonight's faces might be, please do get in touch using the numbers on screen. We'll go through the rest of the lineup a little later. Early on a Monday evening last September, a teenager in Derby was feeling under the weather. She thought a walk in the fresh air around the local nature reserve might help. Tonight, for the first time, she explains what happened next. Her words are spoken by an actor. The past few months have been hard. It's been a challenge to go out on my own. It has made a huge impact on my life. I used to cycle and run a lot on my own. Now I find it very hard to go out on my own at all. I would feel so happy to know that he could never do anything like this to anyone again. That day I hadn't been well. I'm sure you don't want something to eat. No. I'd been sick earlier in the morning. Oh, you're looking a bit peaky. Oh, I didn't really feel like eating. Instead, I decided I would go for a walk to get some fresh air. I didn't take my dog like I would have normally. He wasn't well and couldn't walk very far. When I headed out about five, it was nice weather. Light and fairly mild. Nothing unusual at all. As I walked on the nature reserve from the entrance near the river, I saw a bloke about 100 to 150 metres away. He made me feel a little uncomfortable. I just thought to myself, why should I be afraid? He's just going for a walk by himself, like I am. To avoid walking straight past him, I walk through a gate on my right and walk round the nature reserve that way. I saw no one else until I was almost the whole way round and nearly at the gate on the opposite side of the nature reserve. Then I noticed a figure behind me. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. And realised it was the same guy I saw earlier. He started walking faster. Then before I could run and jump over the gate...
After he left, I got up and found all my clothes that he'd thrown into the bushes. I got dressed quickly. I didn't worry that he would come back at the time. I ran home. I ran the way I'd walked so not to risk bumping into him again. Shortly after, I wasn't too bad. I was very jumpy, but I think I was still in shock. I didn't sleep well for a long time. My boyfriend said that I would shake a lot during the night. <laughs> Something that really shocked me is that during the incident and in my fear, I told the man I was 10 years old thinking that he would feel wrong about what he was about to do. But he didn't. This shows that these kinds of people do not care. These people need to be found and stopped. Such a shocking story. Well, we're joined now by DCI David Cox. It's, it's a terrifying case. It could have happened to anyone. How is this young woman doing now? Yeah, it's a really terrible ordeal to go through, but she has been incredibly uh, brave. What do you know about the man who did it? OK, so uh, the person that we're looking for uh, is a white male, uh, about six foot tall, stocky build, 25 to 30 years old. Uh, we know he was wearing a, a black hooded top with white detail on it. Uh, also that he wore aviator glasses, um, and uh, at one point the... Uh, a witness saw him carrying a, uh, a kind of monster energy drink as well uh, as he was walking through the nature she reserve. was able to give you a very good description you even have his dna but no match yeah um the uh, the description is is really really good um uh, and also the the situation with the forensic evidence uh, is also excellent as well uh, the information is that the the suspect could well have been in the nature reserve uh, anything up to an hour before uh, and what I'd ask is, first of all, if there was anybody in the Nature Reserve on the 7th of September um, and witnessed anybody who matched this description, then please get in touch. Uh, but also, have a good look at the image that uh, has been produced. And if that looks like uh, somebody you know, again, please, please call in. The forensic evidence um, it makes it really easy to eliminate somebody who's not involved in this. Um, so please don't be scared about phoning in. And how much, I mean, it was a very secluded area. She saw very few people at the time. How much do you know about the route here, how he arrived, how he left? Um, yeah, like I say, it was possibly in the nature reserve, anything up to an hour before the offence took place. We know very little uh, of his activities before, um, but uh, certainly afterwards, as you can see on, on the map, he's exited uh, the nature reserve towards the, the northernmost end, uh, which is marked on the map here. And as the victim said, he just didn't care. He did not seem to care. You must be really concerned that he could attack again. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, I think it's worth remembering that this took place back in September, uh, so it was, it was daylight. Um, the, uh, there could have been any number of people in the Nature Reserve who, uh, who interrupted him uh, while he was committing this offence. So, yeah, certainly a very brazen attack. DCI Cox, thank you. Well, please do take another look at this image. If you have any idea who he might be, then do call the studio now on 0500 600 600. Officers are standing by ready to take your call. Or, if you prefer, you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously. They're on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Also, if you've been a victim of any crime, you may want to speak to victim support. They're on 08 08 16 89 OK, time for our CCTV roundup now, and we've got some particularly cunning crooks this month, so keep your eyes peeled. Inside a bar in Shoreditch in London, but this snappily dressed man in a flat cap isn't here for a drink. It's the laptop on the floor he's after. A few nimble moves and, hey presto, he picks up the unsuspecting drinker's computer and just walks away. A different bar almost seven months earlier and he's at it again. He spots what he wants and moves in, swiping another laptop. And same hat, 
Same MO, this time another bar in Shoreditch. He casually uses his foot and steals another computer from right under the owner's nose. The brazen thief even hangs around at the bar before leaving with the stolen goods. Put a stop to this laptop lifter. You know what to do. Now, listen carefully to this one. Private CCTV picks up the sound as these men break into an 88-year-old man's home in Widnes in November last year. They search through the pensioners' possessions. A third man joins them. They take war medals and thousands of pounds worth of other valuables, leaving the victim extremely distressed. Do you recognize these low-life thieves? November again and still in Cheshire, but this time inside a building society in Runcorn. This man pulls out a gun and points it at a terrified worker. Demanding money, he then moves to the next cashier, and then the next, stashing more cash than he can carry. He then walks out, calm as you like, with £6,000 of loot. It's hard to see his face, but someone knows who this gun-wielding bank robber is. Name, please. Lunchtime outside a shop in Toxteth in Liverpool. A security guard arrives to fill the cash machine inside, closely followed by this man in a green hoodie and shorts. In the store, the man in shorts grabs the box before legging it down the street with thousands of pounds in cash. It's hardly subtle, so who is this quick-dash cash thief? Another shop, this time a jeweler's in St Ives in Cornwall. This man isn't hanging around for opening, though. After smashing his way in, he picks up a rubbish bin and heads behind the counter. He forces open a cabinet and fills the bin with expensive jewellery. He then leaves the shop with his haul, worth £30,000. Recognise him, swap his bracelets for handcuffs and shop him. Finally, we have this fella, out shopping on a Wednesday afternoon in September. He's after some high-end jewellery. The only problem is, he doesn't want to pay for it. He asks the assistant if he can look at two expensive watches from the window display, before sitting down to try the first one on, then the second. No prizes for guessing what happens next. A quick glance at the exit, and he sprints out of the shop, still wearing the two watches, worth over £2,000 each. Call time on this crime watch thief and name him tonight. You can take another look at all of tonight's faces and CCTV on the website. Call and text the numbers on screen if you can help. Well, let's just uh, catch up on new developments since we've been on air. DCI Stephen Jennings, uh, good evening to you. Any significant leads on the John Palmer murder? Yes, we've had some um, really important information about John and his activity both in Spain, Tenerife, and also his link to organised crime in the UK. Stephen, there will no doubt be some people watching this programme today who perhaps don't have any sympathy with what's happened to John Palmer and his family too. What would you say to those people? Yeah, I think it's a really important message here. Um, despite John's mistakes in life, I think it's really important that the public help us to try and tackle organised crime, um, crimes involving firearms. It's something that we definitely want to stamp out in the UK. And you specifically want to find out more information about this gun? We do, yeah. There's specifics about the gun, potentially a revolver, potentially a pistol, um, but certainly had some significant um, designs around that gun. So we would like to know where that gun is now, um, who may be able to source that and, and help us identify its location. Uh, DCI Jennings for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Please keep those calls coming. Still to come tonight. Police! How police caught a hit and run killer, but why ten years on she's yet to face justice. This was the most difficult case I've ever been involved with. Um, the investigation was long, complicated, and had many twists and turns. 
More wanted faces, starting with 54-year-old Bruce Brewer, or Bill, as he sometimes calls himself. He was arrested in connection with the sexual assault of two young girls and released on bail. But he's failed to return for questioning. Brewer has links to Surrey, Hampshire, Oxfordshire, Birmingham, Cumbria, Nottingham and Jersey and speaks with a London accent. He's described as having a crooked front tooth. This is Ian Robert Tyler, although this photo is over 15 years old, so his appearance will have changed. He was jailed for 10 years for importing Class A drugs back in 1994, but absconded from prison and is still on the run. Tyler is 50 years old and has friends and family in Essex and Greater London, but police believe he could now be abroad. Face number seven is Jensi Kaburi, although you may know him as Ari Kaburi or Alexis Cordas. He was arrested after a major disturbance at a pub in Greater Manchester in which three people were left with serious injuries. He was due to return to police on bail but has disappeared. He's 42 and originally from Albania but has links across Wiltshire and Greater Manchester. And finally tonight we have Rafael Alexandra Varello. Detectives in Sussex want to question him in connection with drug dealing offences. The 19 year old is originally from Portugal and has friends across Hertfordshire and London. If you know where any of the faces are, then get in touch using the numbers on screen. And of course, they're all on the Crime Watch website. Well, time now to update you on some previous cases, and there were really some fantastic results this evening. Many thanks to your calls. In 2008, we featured the horrific murder of Georgina Edmonds at her cottage in Hampshire. She'd been stabbed several times and battered to death with a rolling pin. Well, after a very long investigation, 36-year-old Matthew Hamlin was last month found guilty of her murder and sentenced to 30 years in prison. He'd faced trial for the killing in 2012, but was acquitted. Detectives then found new DNA evidence, which finally brought him to justice. The court heard Mrs Edmonds had been tortured for her debit card PIN number. Your calls have helped put this man, Thomas Hannafin, behind bars after we showed this footage in March last year. What's them sensors? It's a camera. Oh, you've got cameras, have you? Yeah. Oh, I love Hannafin was wanted for a large number of distraction burglaries at the homes of elderly victims across the southeast of England. His victims were mostly in their 80s and 90s. You called in naming Hannafin and last month he was jailed for 15 years, having been charged with 31 burglaries and one robbery. Well, back in 2012, we featured appeals following a spate of thefts of artefacts from museums and auction houses across the country. The gang smashed a hole in the wall of the Oriental Museum in Durham to steal over £2 million worth of antiques. CCTV caught the thieves arriving at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, where over £15 million of Chinese antiques were stolen. Well, last week, 40 members of an organised crime gang were convicted for their roles in stealing artefacts from museums worth up to £57 million. They will all be sentenced next month. Christian Siwak appeared on the programme last July, wanted for human trafficking offences. You called in with information which led to his arrest within just a few hours of the show. The court heard Siwak, his mother and brother kept a man enslaved for five years, taking his passport from him and keeping his wages. Siwak was jailed for three years and three months. In November, we asked for your help in finding convicted drug dealer Bernard Wanjiru, who was wanted back in prison after failing to stick to the conditions of his early release. Well, your calls led police to East London, where Wanjiru was arrested. He's now been returned to jail to finish his sentence. And finally, we asked for your help in finding this man, Carl Atkins, in March last year. He was wanted for stabbing a man in an attempted robbery in Norfolk. Well, after seeing himself on Crime Watch, Atkins handed himself in and yesterday was jailed for 10 years. Another great result, and we really couldn't do it without you. Now, Thomas Sippeldow was a 54-year-old computer technician at Imperial College in London. Tomorrow will mark exactly 11 years since he was mowed down by a Range Rover as he cycled home. He died almost instantly. 
Despite the obvious severity of his injuries, the driver did not stop. Detectives were unable to trace the person responsible until, that is, they asked for your help. But a decade later, despite being convicted, the woman who killed Thomas is yet to face justice. Thomas Sippel Dow was a German national living in West London. Thomas was an extraordinary person. Uh, he would help anyone. Some people thought he was very strange when they first met him, but when you got to know him, then you realize he was somebody who really had a, a heart of gold. He was a real softy. Thomas worked as a computer technician at Imperial College London. On a dark March evening, he finished his shift and started off on his usual cycle home. Thomas's head injuries were catastrophic. Despite paramedics trying to revive him at the scene, he never regained consciousness. He would have been doing everything properly along that road. I couldn't believe it. I felt devastated um, and very angry, actually. Because Thomas, you know, would not have done anything wrong. This was the most difficult case I've ever been involved with. Um, the investigation was long, complicated, and had many twists and turns. CCTV footage showed a dark car speeding away from the scene seconds after Thomas was hit. It jumped a red light before making a quick getaway down the Earl's Court Road. Eyewitnesses described the car as a Range Rover, but they didn't catch the registration. Detectives investigating the case had their work cut out for them. Forensically, we didn't recover anything from the scene. Um, however, we did find quite a lot of debris that we thought probably was from the vehicle that failed to stop. We realised we'd got some coloured bodywork and it looked to be a very unusual colour. The debris was taken to a Land Rover dealer for inspection. That's our 50th anniversary colour. The paint was called Atlantis Blue. Only 85 Range Rovers had ever been made with that shade and one of those was almost certainly the vehicle that mowed Thomas down. Well, this was a monumental stroke of good fortune um, because it narrowed our search down considerably. With a price tag of £70,000, it was clear the police were hunting for a criminal with considerable means. Land Rover gave them the vehicle identity numbers of all 85 cars from which officers produced a list of registered owners. As I now had 85 names and addresses. Working through those was a long, slow process three months down the line, only a handful had been traced and eliminated. It was hoped an appeal on Crime Watch would speed up the search. It's a Range Rover, but it's in Atlantis blue. That's what makes it so rare. Incredibly, one caller thought they'd seen a damaged Atlantis blue Range Rover 100 miles away in the Midlands. He'd actually seen a car like this that day at a small garage in a village outside Leicester. So the day after the programme, a colleague and I went up to look at the vehicle. I didn't want to get my hopes up, but I was very excited. Yes, Atlantis Blue, all right. In amongst the debris recovered from the incident was a broken piece of headlamp. Forensic examinations of the Range Rover in Leicester showed it came from that car. This proved beyond all doubt that this vehicle had been at the scene and was almost certainly the vehicle that had killed Thomas. Someone had tried to have its identity destroyed. They failed, and police were able to track the car back to its original owner, a woman by the name of Natela Galogre. She was a multi-millionaires uh, with connections within the Georgian and Russian communities. She certainly knew a number of very, very wealthy Russian oligarchs. 
and uh, moved in quite wealthy circles. But when police went to question her, she'd vanished. However, they soon discovered where she'd been the night that Thomas was run down. We were able to prove that she attended a function at the House of Lords on the night of the collision. Uh, and in fact, we were able to obtain pictures which showed her drinking at that event. Now, Taylor left the House of Lords early at 9 o'clock. The collision happened at 10.15. Minutes after that, she was spotted by a neighbour parking up in her mansion block garage. Significantly, he noticed damage to the Range Rover. The evidence was stacking up against her, and she aroused even further suspicion when detectives discovered that she'd fled to her mother's home in Moscow, where, as a Russian citizen, she could not be extradited. It was frustrating, to say the least, to know that we had the owner of the vehicle that had killed Thomas identified uh, and that we weren't in a position to, to arrest them and, and question them about what happened on that night. But five months later, police were tipped off that she'd returned to London. When they found her, she dramatically changed her appearance. A telegolobbering? Yes. It was, yeah, a big sigh of relief, actually, <laughs> to know that somebody'd been arrested. And I kind of thought, almost thought, OK, that's almost like that's the beginning of the end. I was obviously elated. We now had the opportunity to try and question her about what happened on the night that Thomas died. The Taylor's story was elaborate. She laid the blame for Thomas's death on a labourer called Georgi Giashvili. She said he dropped her off that night and then borrowed her car. Georgi Giashvili. We managed to trace the identity of Georgi Giashvili, uh, and what we found was quite shocking. It turned out that he was found dead three months after Thomas was hit. It seemed that he jumped off Westminster Bridge at the end of June 2005 uh, and had been found washed up further on down the Thames a couple of days later. Detectives began to unpick Natalia's story. Prior to his death, Georgie had worked as a labourer on building sites in Manchester. He'd been working there on the day of Thomas's death. Amazingly, even after all this time, the firm still had George's timesheets. Look at this. They showed that he'd been working until 5 p.m. on the day of the collision. It was impossible for Georgie to finish work at 5 p.m. and drop her off at the House of Lords in London an hour and a half later. The Taylor's alibi was shattered. She'd spun a web of lies from the beginning of this investigation and it's clear that she sought to pin the blame on a dead man. In January 2006, 10 months after Thomas was killed, Natalia was charged. She was released on bail and forbidden from leaving the UK. Over the next two years, she changed her legal team several times, ensuring the trial was dragged out for as long as possible. In October 2007, she made an application to the Crown Court for her Russian passport to be returned to her. This apparently was so that she could go to a, a memorial service for her father in Russia. Astonishingly, the judge agreed to her request. Natalia flew to Russia on the promise she'd return and stand trial a month later. It was a promise she had no intention of keeping. She didn't turn up for the trial and her representatives said that she had pneumonia and was too ill to travel. There then followed a litany of medical conditions that Natella seemed to be suffering from in Russia. These included epilepsy, ischemic heart disease, other neurological disorders. The judge ruled that the trial would go ahead without her. And four years after the collision that killed Thomas, Natella was convicted of causing death by dangerous driving and perverting the course of justice by a unanimous verdict. In her absence, Natalia was ordered to serve 10 years in prison for the death of Thomas. She showed her cowardice by choosing to hide out in Russia, never returning to the UK to serve her sentence. 
Well, Inspector John Payton, who you saw in that film, has since retired, though he has never given up hope that Natalia will serve her sentence. Unfortunately, it looks like that is not going to happen. According to Russian authorities, she passed away in 2012. Whatever the truth, it looks like there is no chance of her facing justice for what she did. Time for some updates and some really exciting news. Daniel Rutter was the third wanted face that we showed you. Remember, he was serving a life sentence for wounding with intent and absconded from prison. Well, someone claiming to be Daniel Rutter has handed himself in to police. We are going to make sure that we've checked his identity and verify that, and we'll give you an update in the update program, which, of course, comes a little bit later. Wanted face number two, Tariq Javed. Some possible sightings of him. He was found guilty of sexually abusing a young child. And then we also have some good news on the linked attacks in the Lewisham areas, a possible name for this attacker. Please keep the course coming in. Well, that is everything for now, but please remember to take a look at the Crime Watch website where you can find all of our appeals. The phone lines stay open until midnight tomorrow, and we'll be back with an update tonight at 10.45 after the news. The viewers in Northern Ireland will have to wait until 11.25. We will, of course, also keep you up to date with the latest developments via Twitter. Follow at BBC Crime Watch. Thank you so much for all of your calls so far from everyone here. Goodbye. <laughs>